Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. The Scientific Odyssey Unscripted The Trappist Discoveries. So here we are in one of our unscripted Scientific Odyssey episodes. This is one of those times where something comes up in the news of science where I just feel like I want to take a little bit of time and talk about what's been done, what's been discovered, and what's happened. And trying to write up a script usually takes more time than I would like, especially as it takes time away from the uh, narrative or other stuff that I'm doing. And so I'll put out one of these unscripted episodes. So if you haven't heard one of these, and we've done this, I think this is our fourth one of these. If you haven't heard one of these before, what you'll understand is that this is certainly less, uh, less polished. There'll be uh, more pauses and interruptions, breaks, that sort of thing. A little more stream of consciousness thought. But it's also something I think that'll give you a sense of uh, sort of how this kind of discussion, this kind of a, a process goes forward. What I'd like to talk about in this episode is what are known as the uh, Trappist um, discoveries. And this is the discovery, you may have heard the news, of the seven very much Earth-like planets, rocky, small, orbiting a small star about 40 light years from the Earth. And I want to talk a little bit about that discovery and about what it means and, and those kinds of things and answer some of the questions about what's important about this and what's purely speculation and all of those sorts of things. So first thing I'd like to do is just talk a moment about the, the telescope itself and about the things that made the discovery um, and why this whole thing is called TRAPPIST. And so the TRAPPIST telescope, or what's just, it's actually just called TRAPPIST, stands for Transiting Planets and Planetismals Small Telescope. And the reason it's, you know, you come up with that sort of an acronym is because it spells out TRAPPIST because you know what you want to say because this is a telescope operated uh, by the, the University of Liège out of Belgium. And if you've got that history of those great TRAPPIST monasteries that make that wonderful beer, well, you know, that's why they got to name it that. The telescope is at a, an observing site in uh, La Cilia, Chile. Um, it overlooks the Pacific Ocean at a part of the Pacific Ocean where the water um, over which it looks is extraordinarily cool, which is excellent for observing because it creates a very stable atmosphere, re reducing atmospheric distortion, and that's going to be really important for our story as we go forward. And what these guys have found that the telescope was first funded in 2008, and it saw first light about 2010. And the point of the telescope, as the title uh, sort of suggests, was to look at various stars and see if they could see planets transiting. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in a few minutes. And so it made its first observations of this star in 2013. And it was in 2015 that it saw the first planets transiting that star. And so, you know, you got to wonder what that must have been like for those those astronomers, the, the principal investigator um, and his team. Um, I think his name is Michele Guillon. And uh, that team there, as they first saw that data come back, and it indicated that they had found planets orbiting the stars. But the thing that's even more interesting about this is, is as they gathered more information, they began to realize that these planets might be an awful lot like the Earth. And that had to be a really exciting time. And so, Probably sometime in, oh, I don't know, roughly 2016, May of 2016, this group really began to get data back and they began to realize that they really, really were onto something. And so they began to request some assistance from other observatories. And uh, the astronomical community, as it often does, just jumped right in. 
And so they're going to get, uh, or they did get, um, extra observations from the very large telescope in Chile, which is one of the most powerful astronomical instruments that's, that are here on the surface of the Earth. They also got help from two uh, space-based telescopes that we'll talk about in a great deal more detail down the road here just a little bit, and that's the Hubble Space Telescope and the Spitzer Space Telescope. And they were able to use all of those things in conjunction with you know, the European Space Agency, um, NASA and JPL to do a lot of processing to find this really remarkable system. And I think, you know, before we, we talk about the details of that, I think one of the things that really should be understood here is just the, the nature of the scientific collaboration. You know, it was a small group and a small team at a small telescope, sort of, I don't want to say toiling on obscurity or anything like that, because it certainly isn't the case, but it's, you know, a small part of the astronomical community. But as they get a discovery and they're, they're, they get, the, get onto the scent of something pretty important, they're able to put out the call to these other scientists, these other astronomers, these other facilities, and actually not just facilities, but whole organizations, who then very quickly mobilize the resources that they have to help and to help better understand the, the system being studied. And it's really just a remarkable story. So what they have found, of course, are what are called exoplanets. Sometimes you don't call them extrasolar planets, but these are planets. These are objects orbiting other stars not orbiting our sun, like the, uh, the, the eight planets and a couple of minor planets, comets, and that sort of thing orbit our sun, but they orbit a, another star. Um, and so I want to take a moment here to talk a little bit about how you find exoplanets in the first place, sort of take a big picture view, and then zoom in just a little bit. So there are three or four ways that you kind of look for these things. Um, the first way to look at them is probably the, the most obvious, but one of the hardest ways, and that is just, you know, you get a telescope with a lot of resolution, which means it has to have a very big objective mirror. All telescopes now have mirrors. And it gathers a lot of light, and because it gathers a lot of light, it's able to resolve between things that are very closely spaced together and that are very dim. And um, you uh, observe a star and you look for things going around that star. Now, the thing that's really interesting is this is very hard to do because the star is so bright that its light has this tendency to overpower anything you might be able to see. So there has to be a little bit of blocking of that light and a little bit of trickery that goes on there. And it turns out for a very few fairly close stars, we've actually been able to image planets, not very clearly, but image planets around those stars just with the telescope. But understand that that's not how we found most of these planets. So the second way we did we do this, and this is how the first exoplanets were discovered, is it turns out, and we've talked about gravitation here in our previous episodes, so it turns out that um, when you talk about Newton's universal law of gravitation, we talk about the fact that it's, you know, say in our solar system, it is the gravitational influence of the sun that pulls on the earth. Well, it turns out by Newton's third law, as we've discussed, that the third law says that for every force acting on an object from an environment, that object exerts a force back into the environment of the same type and of the same size. So just as the sun is pulling on the earth, the earth pulls back on the sun. And what that means is that makes the sun wobble just a little bit. Okay. Now for something like the earth, the earth has so little mass compared to the sun it doesn't cause the sun to wobble all that much. The gravitational forces between the two are the same, but because the sun has so much more mass, it doesn't move a whole lot in response to that force. However, a planet the size of Jupiter can create, you know, kind of a little bit of a wobble. And there's a way to detect that wobble. And the way that you do that is, is it turns out that when stars give off light, they give off light in what are what's called a spectrum. It's sort of this rainbow of light, and it turns out that that spectrum has dark lines in it. And it, when those when those lines are seen, they're always seen in very pr particular places based off the fingerprint of that star. And that's something we're going to talk about in an episode probably a couple of months from now. And so the thing that's really interesting about that is if the star's moving towards you, those lines shift a little bit towards the blue side of the spectrum. And if the star is moving away from you, they shift a little bit towards the red side of the spectrum. And so by measuring that shift, what we can determine is that star wobbling back and forth. And then doing a little bit of mathematics, you can determine how big the thing going around the star has to be and sort of some of its orbital characteristics, okay? And so this is sort of what's sometimes called a spectroscopic Doppler shift method, 
or something like that, where it measures what we call radial velocities, if you want the big fancy term. And the thing that was really interesting is you've got to be pretty precise to detect those shifts. And so initially, this methodology was only used to detect fairly large planets, things the size of Jupiter or maybe even bigger. And we found a number of extrasolar planets this way, but they were all these big, what we call gas giant type planets, planets that were very, very large. So oftentimes they were in fairly what we think of as exotic orbits, which means they might have been a gas giant, but very close into the star or something like that. Um, and so this was something that can be done with Earth-based Earth observatories fairly well. Um, the Keck telescopes, very good for this over down in Hawaii, the very large telescope in Chile, um, the telescopes on the Canary Islands, very, very good at this kind of a thing. And so we detected a number of extrasolar planets. The problem with this is it's very hard to see small planets. Small planets don't cause much of a wobble. And so we tended not to see very many Earth-like planets. Another way you can do this is something called gravitational lensing, and it's this idea that using the ideas of Einstein's theory of general relativity, that you get uh, the mass of a star can sort of warp space-time, and that can act as a lens. And so things that go behind the star, you actually can get a good, or you can get a little bit of a magnification of or look at that way. We detected a couple of planets this way, but I want to you know, be very careful to say, state that number is very, very small, I think less than 10. So of late, the biggest way that we've found these extrasolar planets has been with what's called the transit method. And the biggest source of those detections has been a spacecraft known as the Kepler spacecraft, which is able to detect these things really, really well. Um, the story of the Kepler spacecraft in and of itself is just really quite remarkable. It's a spacecraft. We put it up. It didn't quite work right. We got it working, it failed, and then all of a sudden they figured out, even as it failed, how to get it to work anyway. It's a, a tale of remarkable engineering. But the way this transit thing works, and it's there's a, there's a really nice analogy, is think of if you have, say, a light bulb. You've got a 100-watt light bulb, and it's sitting out, you know, we'll say it's incandescent, and it's sitting out, you know, in your backyard somewhere, okay? And you're sitting, you're sitting on the porch, and this thing's maybe 50 feet or 100 feet away, and it's sitting out there. And what you know is, is, of course, when you put a light out, you're going to attract insects, right? You know, maybe you're going to attract some, some moths, you're going to attract some smaller things, maybe a lightning bug or two, who knows, right? But what's going to happen is, is that as you, say, look at that light bulb out there, you get a sense of the fact of the bugs being around the light bulb, being attracted to the light bulb, because every once in a while, if you see a bug fly in front of the light bulb, the light bulb looks a little dimmer, right? The, the amount of light you get from the light bulb is a little dimmer. And the bigger the thing that travels in front of that light bulb, the more the light bulb will dim. And you can get a sense, even if you sort of know some things about the size of the light bulb and how far away you are, by, you know, how much it dims and by how long it dims for, you can even maybe determine some things about how fast the bug's moving and how big the bug is moving. And that's a really great analogy for what we do with this transit method where we look at the light, and technically the fancy term you'll hear an astronomer use, look at the light curve, but it's really we're just looking at the amount of light coming from the star. And if a planet, or something else, but let's just say a planet moves in front of that star, the amount of light we get from that star will drop. The bigger the planet, the more the light we get from the star drops. The faster the planet moves, the... Uh, the, the less time the light will drop for, and you know the, the longer the light drops for, the slower we know that planet is moving. And one of the things we know from Kepler's laws of planetary motion, the farther away a planet is from a star, the more slowly it's going to move in its orbit. And so by looking at those transit times, we can begin to get a sense of the orbital characteristics of the planets orbiting the star. And so that's kind of what was done. That's what this telescope, the, tran the TRAPPIST, excuse me, the TRAPPIST telescope was designed to do. It was designed to measure the light from stars, and it was specifically the, the project that uh, the group here from the, the University of Liège was doing is they were specifically looking at low-mass stars, very dim stars, I'll talk about that here in a second, and things like that to do research on that. And so... That kind of brings us to what they've actually discovered, what's known as TRAPPIST-1A, which is the star itself, okay? So what do we know about this star? The star is 
Um, you'll hear it called a, a low mass or an ultra cool dwarf star. For those of you who keep track of things like spectral classes, it's officially classified an M8 um, star. It has about 8% of the mass of the sun and about 11% the radius of the sun. So it's much, much smaller than the sun. In fact, it's probably more appropriate to compare it in some respects to Jupiter in terms of, of some of the things that are going on that it is to the sun. Um, if you think of all the, the gas giant Jupiter in our solar system, this star, and I want you to understand this is a star, not a planet, this star is 80 or so, 85 times more massive than Jupiter, but because of the way things work, it's only about, it's only pretty much about the same size. Okay, it's just a little bit bigger than Jupiter. Um, now, when we say it's an ultra cool dwarf star, what that means is the temperature at the surface is about 2,500 degrees Kelvin, or just 2,500 Kelvin. We actually don't say degrees when we, we talk about it in terms of Kelvin temperature. Um, so it's 2,500 Kelvin. Just to give you a comparison, the sun is approximately 5,700 Kelvin. Okay, so the sun's much, much hotter. And this turns out to be really, really important to understand about some things um, about the light that this star, TRAPPIST-1, gives off. It turns out that the bigger a star you are, the uh, more energy that you produce. The more energy you produce, the uh, not only are, the, are you going to be brighter, but your temperature at the surface of the star is going to be higher. And it turns out that the temperature determines sort of where the majority of the light you give off is. And you're kind of probably familiar with this if you have sort of an electric range or maybe a toaster or a toaster oven. If you've ever turned that electric stove top on, what you know is that um, as you run electric current through the element of the stove top, you'll sort of see that you'll f actually feel the stove top and you, you'll think it's getting hot. That's actually not exactly what's going on. Um, and then you'll see it start glowing just this very dull red. And then as it gets hotter, that red will get brighter and it will also get more red and then you know if you really have it cranked up and you feel like risking life and limb which i don't exist you know i don't think you should ought to do but if you turn it way up that that element might actually start to glow kind of orange now if you continue through that progression you'd eventually get to something like what happens in the filament of a light bulb where the filament of the light bulb starts to glow yellow and almost white and if you continue you'll go up through the electromagnetic spectrum in terms of visible light so the hotter you are, you know, you go from red through yellow to white to blue, etc. So the sun, as we know, is a, is a yellow star, okay? At 5,700 Kelvin, it's a, it's a yellow kind of a star. So this thing, this, this star that we're looking at, this TRAPPIST-1, it's only 2,500 or so Kelvin, which means it's much, much cooler. And so it turns out that much like your burner when it's, you know, before you can start seeing it glow, or maybe when it's glowing just very dull red, it actually gives off most of its what we call electromagnetic radiation or light in the infrared part of the spectrum. Infrared part of the spectrum. And that's why, by the way, when you hold your hand up towards the burner and you feel like there's, you know, your hand gets warm, that's actually interesting because what's really going on there is, is that the burner is giving off electromagnetic radiation in the infrared part of the spectrum. That's getting absorbed by your hand and the nerves in your hand are sending chem electrochemical signals up to your brain, which your brain interprets as heat. Um, which is really interesting because that basically means you have infrared radiation detectors in, in the skin of your body um, that your your brain then interprets in a very specific physical sensation. So this star at 2,500 Kelvin is, you know, in very much in the, the low end of the red part of the spectrum, and the majority of its light is given off in infrared. And that's why these particular instruments end up being used to observe this. Now, if you were to look for this star, the star is found in the constellation of Aquarius. Um, so it is in the zodiacal part of the uh, the sky across that zodiacal belt. Um, interestingly enough, this uh, type of star, these low mass M class red infrared type of stars, make up about 75% of the stars we see in the universe. One of the things that's really interesting when you go out at night and you look up in the sky and you see all these bright, beautiful stars, what you're really seeing are the lighthouses, the big, bright stars that you can see from a long ways away. They turn out all of those together are less than you know a quarter of what we see in the sky 
these cool M-class stars then are about 10 times more common than our sun, which is still a fairly low mass star. And so that's really, really very important. Um, a couple of other things, like we said, it's actually 39.5 light years away. I want to come back to that and just sort of put a thumbtack that in your, about that in your, your brain. Um, it gives off about 0.05% um, the light, amount of light that the sun gives off. It's very, very dim. And as we said, most of this is uh, emitted in the infrared part of the spectrum. So these kinds of stars, if you're using a regular telescope, are really, really hard to see. Okay, if you're using an optical telescope, the standard kind of telescope, we tend to think about, you know, amateurs set them up in their backyard or whatever. Those are looking in parts of the spectrum we can see with our eye. Most of the light this thing gives off, and it's not giving off very much light at all, are not seen in those wavelengths. And so it turns out that what you have to do when you make these observations is it's best to make them in the infrared part of the spectrum. The difficulty with making observations in the infrared part of the spectrum is our atmosphere isn't exactly what you would call transparent to infrared light. It turns out that carbon dioxide and water vapor tend to absorb wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation in the infrared part of the spectrum. And so that becomes problematic if you want to make observations. So there is kind of a way to get around that, and that is just get above as much of the atmosphere as you can, especially the part of the atmosphere that has lots and lots of water in it. And so what you tend to want to do is you want to take these telescopes, and we're doing this with all telescopes now, but especially these infrared telescopes. The Keck telescope is probably the best earlier example of this. Um, the Wind telescope at Kitt Peak National Observatory. Um, the very large telescope in Chile. Um, those kinds of things, the Gemini telescopes. Um, those telescopes, which are all set up to make observations in the infrared, are all at very, very high altitudes. So this... Uh, this site in La Silla, Chile, is up at the top of the Andes Mountains. It's very, very high up. And so you're over, you're above, I should say, most of the water vapor and a lot of the carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. And so you are able to do observations in the infrared part of the spectrum. And usually you do that through a combination of things, but the most important is what we call remote observing. The idea that you control the telescope from someplace further down the mountain, the telescope can actually sit on the mountain. One of the things that's really interesting is, is the, at the Keck telescope site there in Mauna Kea, they actually have to do this as remote observing because at 14,000 feet, which is where I think that thing is, um, you actually can't stay up there for more than about four hours before you start suffering from really significant hypoxia effects. So all of the obser observing is done from a remote site on a lot of these uh, high mountain telescopes. So when they found these things, what they, they did is they pushed the telescope right to the limits of what it could do as an observing station with the technology that they had. And so once you do that, you sort of got to go get help, which is, of course, what they did. And now the thing I should note is there in, in 2015, the consortium here, this group out of the University of Liège, published a paper in Nature, and the paper said they had found two objects transiting the, the star and possibly a third, but they weren't certain. And so they said, but we think we would like some help trying to resolve this third object if you guys can lend us a hand. And so, of course, the guys at the VLA um, and some of the, these other things decided to do that. Um, and most important to this was the Spitzer Space Telescope. Now, the Spitzer Space Telescope, I want to spend a little time talking about this because this is really kind of an interesting thing. The Spitzer Space Telescope was um, part of a, a great telescopes program. Okay, back in the 70s, NASA realized that it was time to really put some really powerful telescopes above the Earth's atmosphere to get the clearest picture of things in the cosmos that they could get. And so there were four telescopes planned. Um, the first was the uh, Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. In the 1990s, it was the first thing launched. Um, and that's so that we could take a look at those. The second of those launched was the Hubble Space Telescope, which I think everybody's familiar with, with a 2.4 meter mirror. Um, most of its observing is in the optical part of the spectrum, though I think in the last upgrade they did, they did put on infrared cameras because that's where a lot of the astronomy is being done now. The uh, next telescope was the Chandrasekhar X-ray Observatory, and then the final telescope that got, uh, got put in orbit was the Spitzer Infrared Telescope in 2003. And the whole point of the Spitzer Infrared Telescope was to do all of its observing 
in that part of the spectrum. And one of the things that's really interesting is it took all of the lessons that we learned from the Hubble mission and really incorporated them into the design and operation of the telescope. And so a couple of things, when the, the telescope was originally launched, it was launched with a, a coolant to keep all of the telescope components cold so that the telescope components themselves did not generate any infrared radiation just by having temperature, kind of like, again, that that idea that you've got a little element in your uh, your stovetop. If you put any, run any electricity through it, it warms up a little bit and gives off infrared light. All of the electronic components on the telescope would have done that. So they put a coolant in there to keep the telescope cold. Now that coolant lasted for five years. And unlike the Hubble Space Telescope, which we could go up with the space shuttle until that program was discontinued, the Spitzer Space Telescope could never be serviced because of the way the orbit of that sets up. And so by 2008, it wasn't able to do those kinds of observations. But the thing that's really amazing is, is that the engineers at JPL and that the, the, the Spitzer, kind of the group, the, 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 the control team and the engineering team figured out how to work around that and how to do some things with that telescope far beyond, and I mean far beyond its original design capacities. And one of those was to be able to look for these kinds of objects. And so the guys at Spitzer, um, they did some really amazing things. They took the telescope and they pointed it at the star for 20 straight days. Now you have to understand the demand for time on these big space-based observatories you know and by the way Compton's the only one that's still is no longer operational so the other three are still operational the the demand for the time on these things is just phenomenally large okay there are astronomers all over the world that want to use these things to collect data and make observations and get papers written and published and all of those sorts of things so for the Spitzer team to tell everybody okay we're gonna take 20 days of observing time and we're gonna continuously observe this star and this star alone is really very, very remarkable. And so that's what they did. They observed this thing and what they found was even more remarkable than uh, anybody had expected. So what they found is that they, uh, they found the two original worlds that the, the team out of Liège had found. But then what they did is they found that that planet or that, yeah, the planet, I guess, that the Liège team thought was there was actually three planets and there were two more. So there's a total of seven worlds all orbiting around this cool, dim star. And it's really quite remarkable. Now, what's even more amazing about this though, and this is where the Spitzer data becomes so tremendously important, is that as these worlds go around, as we talked about in the, the last episode on Newton and the Principia, each of these worlds are moving under the influence of the gravitational effect of the star, but they also exert gravitational effects on each other. They tug and pull on each other gravitationally. And because they're, they're cl so close together, as we'll talk about here in a moment, because they're so close together, those tugs are actually pretty observable. And so what the, the team with Spitzer was able to do was take all of this data, run it through some pretty complicated computer algorithms and begin to separate out, separate out the different orbital periods for each of these objects and how those things changed as they came close to or went far away from other worlds. What this allows you to do is first off, we can do stuff with Kepler's laws, right? We can, you know, we can look at the ellipticity or the eccentricity of these worlds, which is something that they did. They, you know, we can look at using Kepler's third law to determine, you know, not only you know, where the planets are, we can use them to determine the mass of the star itself. Um, but the big thing is if we can use those gravitational interactions, this idea that Newton's law of gravitation works there, to determine the mass of each of these worlds. Also, by looking at the rate at which, you know, the light dips down in the transit extinction curve, or that light curve, we get, a, we get an estimate, and it's a pretty good estimate, of the sizes of these objects. And that turns out to be just tremendously remarkable. And before I talk about those things, I just want to mention one other thing. And this is a point that we made in our last episode there on Newton. And that is, I want to emphasize the sense of universality. Everything being done with these planets going around this star is using Newton's universal law of gravitation. Every calculation, every piece of this, every tug, every pull that's been worked on has been worked out believing that Newton's laws are accurate and correct. And that's really remarkable. That's that idea that I talked about, that 
when we come up with a law of nature here in our local environment on the earth, and no, you know, I mean, in a sense, this law of nature, we're talking about apples falling to the surface of the earth or the moon going around the earth. And we sort of, you know, or Newton, I should say, sort of works it all out. He says it applies everywhere. And we, we work on that assumption. And it turns out that it does apply in this system very, very clearly. We got very, very precise, very, very accurate, accurate results. And I think it's just really an amazing thing that we have this picture of the universe where we say that a law of the universe here on the earth applies everywhere. And that's just, you know, this is a really, really phenomenal example of that kind of thinking. So let's talk just a little bit about the system itself. And that's, you know, the best way to think of this is this is a solar system and it contains at least, and this is what we've just so far, but there's at least seven worlds. Now it turns out what's really amazing about these worlds is all of them are roughly the size of the earth. Okay, so if we think of the Earth as having, you know, one Earth radius, the smallest of these worlds has 0.76 Earth radiuses, and that's the one that's farthest out, and that's probably the one we know we were the least sure about because we weren't able to get full observations on it with uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope, so it may actually be a little different than that, but they're, they're fairly confident about that number. Up through probably the largest of these objects being about um, 1.13 times the size of the Earth. So... All of them fit in a fairly narrow range that's pretty darn close to what the Earth is. The other thing is, is by doing some of the calculations about the, um, about the, uh, the influences between the different worlds on each other, we were able to get good estimates of the mass. And it turns out all of these worlds are fairly close to the mass of the Earth as well. So, um... The, the smallest of the worlds, which is the D world, which is the third one out, the star gets called A, and then they're sort of lettered sequentially outward from there. So the B world, C world, the D world, which is the third one out, is the, you know, it's, it's the smallest or almost the smallest one that we've got. It's at, you know, only about three quarters the size of the Earth, and it's only a little less than half the mass of the Earth. So one of the things we know is that if you take the mass of a world and you divide it by its volume, you come up with something sort of an average density. And it turns out that world would have a, a smaller average density than the Earth, maybe something closer to what we see on Mars. Most of the other worlds are about the same density as the Earth, maybe a little bigger, a little bit smaller. What's really also fascinating about these worlds is because this star is so very small, it doesn't give off a lot of light like we talked about. These worlds turn out to be clustered in really, really close to their star, to that Trappist A star. So let's talk a little bit about that to give you a sense. And again, this is one of those places where thinking about the Jovian system, Jupiter and its four large moons that are now, we call them the Galilean moons. But if you'll remember from our episode, Galileo actually called them the Medicean moons after his sponsor and patron, Cosimo de' Medici, right? And so the idea here is if you were to look at the, the Jupiter system, and remember, Jupiter's just a little bit smaller than this world, the furthest out of those four moons, and they, they go in the order of Eo, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. I always remember it by I eat green carrots. I don't know why that works for me. It just always does. But if you look at the orbit of Callisto, the orbit of Callisto, that furthest out large moon, of Jupiter is at about the same orbit as the innermost of these seven planets going around the Trappist A star. So if we look at Trappist B, its distance is about 1% the distance of the, our star, the Sun, to the Earth. Okay, we call that distance, by the way, an astronomical unit, the distance from the Sun to the Earth. So this object's distance from the Trappist A star, that distance from Trappist A to Trappist B, is 0 0.011 astronomical units. So in very, very close, the farthest away has about, uh, it's about 6% or 0 0.06 astronomical units away from its star. So these are clustered in very, very close um, to that central star. And they have to be, or don't have to be, I guess, that's probably a, a bad way to say it. But what that, why, the reason that's so interesting and so important is, has to do with something we call every star having a habitable zone. So when you look at a star and you look at the amount of energy it gives off, it turns out that there's going to be a certain distance away from that star where water has a chance to be liquid. 
And so it turns out that for this star, the, the, the region that we would call the habitable, habitable zone, it turns out three of the worlds are very, very comfortably in that habitable zone where we would expect water to be able to be liquid. So it turns out that's E, F, and I believe it's the G star, or G planet. It might be the D planet. I haven't quite been able to nail that down. But the other thing that's interesting is depending on things like atmospheric conditions, the other four might also have the possibility of heart having liquid water. And so the thing that's really fascinating about this is this is the first time where we have found this large a number of Earth-sized worlds in a habitable zone of a star. Now, this isn't the first time we found that, okay? Kepler actually found um, a world like this in a habitable zone around the Proxima Centauri star, only four light years away. But we've never seen a system that's this sort of rich in these kinds of worlds. And as we're going to talk about here in a minute, that's really an important thing to understand. And so um, a couple of other things that we know about these worlds. Um, we, we have a pretty good sense that because they're so close, they are what we call tidally locked. And that's kind of a strange thing. So let me see if I can explain that. When you go out at night and you look at the moon, what you'll notice is you'll always see the same face of the moon. Okay, you never see the back side as it's usually called. Now, by the way, that's not the dark side. That's, you know, as great an album title as the dark side of the moon is, it's a complete misnomer to say that one side of the moon is always lit and one side of the moon is always dark. That's not how it is. The um, way it works is one side of the moon always faces the earth. And when you're in a full moon, that side's all lit up and the back side's not lit. And when you're in a new moon, the side facing the earth gets no light, which means we don't see it. And the side not facing the earth gets all the light. So all parts of the moon get light. But what you should understand is that the reason you have that tidal locking and that is, or that, that case of the moon, all the same face of the moon always pointed towards the earth is that tidal locking, that idea that because of the interaction of the moon with the fluid parts, the oceans on the surface of the earth, the rotation rate of the moon, how fast it turns on its axis, and its revolution rate around the earth, how fast it goes around the earth, are the same number, okay? It's about 27.3 days. And so that's, that's something that happens due to that interaction gravitationally with the satellite object and the fluid portion of the thing that's going around. We know that all of Jupiter's moons are tidally locked around Jupiter because Jupiter has this great big gas atmosphere that acts as the fluid that locks the rotation and revolution rates together on those moons we're fairly certain that a similar physical process, and again, we're going back to this idea of universality, a similar physical process is going to work with these worlds. So we think that most of these worlds, they're probably one-to-one -one tidally locked. Their same face of the world points towards the star at all times. Now the question is going to be, what would that do to an environment of that kind of world? That's kind of an interesting thing to ask. The other thing we know is these worlds have sort of what we call orbital resonances with each other. Um, and that basically means that we have these sort of integer ratios between how long it takes the worlds to go around. So what you may have is, as an example, if the E world goes around five times, the F world might go around eight times. And so you have an eight to five orbital resonance there. And you find a bunch of those in these, these worlds. And so what you get a very, very clear sense, and again, this is not, um, this is not unusual. This is something we see in the moons around Jupiter all the time is that these worlds are interacting with each other gravitationally in very predictable ways. So that's, a, that's an important thing to sort of talk about with these worlds. Um, the other thing that we did is once we sort of realized that these worlds were kind of interesting in the way that they are, they pointed the Hubble Space Telescope and um, they let the Hubble Space Telescope do the observations of these worlds, which it can do because the world is so, these, the sun, or the star I should say, not the sun, but the star here is so dim in the visible part of the spectrum. They were able to let the light from the star sort of shine past these worlds. Now, if these worlds had been sort of gas giants or mostly hydrogen and helium as the light passed through those atmospheres, the atmospheres would have absorbed certain wavelengths of light. We call that absorption spectroscopy. And so when Hubble looked for that, it did not see absorption spectroscopy for either hydrogen or helium, which means these are not worlds, say, like Neptune or Uranus. Okay, these are worlds that are small, rocky type worlds, we think. Now, the question of whether they have atmospheres at all or not, 
That's a whole nother question. It turns out Hubble is not powerful enough to actually get enough light to be able to determine that from its, its ability to do the observations. And so one of the things you got to ask is what happens there. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So what this all means is first off, we've got Earth-sized worlds, rocky, in the habitable zone around a star. And that means that, you know, if something else doesn't happen, if there isn't something else going on, we can probably be reasonably assured and expecting that there is liquid water on at least three of these worlds. And that's really an important and intriguing thing. Because what that means is we have a sense that liquid water is one of those things that is very conducive to the formation of life. Now, I need to talk a little bit about that because it's such a loaded thing to say. Say, oh, the possibility of formation of life and what everybody thinks about is these guys, you know, with, you know, weird looking eyes and strange colored skin or something like that, you know, depending on what your science fiction franchise is. In science, when we talk about life, what we're really talking about in its most basic sense is self-replicating chemistry. Do you have molecules that have an ability to encode information and then make copies of that information in other molecules? Okay. In life on the earth, we do that with DNA. Okay. But who knows how that might happen there if it happens at all. So that's the first thing is the question is, is if there is water, we know that in environments where there is liquid water, the ability to create long chain organic molecules is pretty high. And those molecules, you know, when we do experiments here on Earth, start to look quite a bit like DNA. Now, we've never gotten anything here on Earth to make copies of itself. And so maybe that's the, the, the step that can't be taken. But we would assume if you've got, again, universality, if you have those processes taking place on the Earth in liquid water, if we have similar environments on these worlds orbiting Trappist A, similar processes might take place there. So the next question, of course, is, you know, as you run through this, you start asking, okay, well, maybe there's life, but is there more? Is there what we would think of as intelligent communicating life? And that's always the first question everyone wants to ask. And the joke, by the way, amongst most astrophysicists is, you know, the first question you always get asked is, is it aliens? And the answer is, no, it's not aliens. The, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence out of the University of California at Berkeley, they have pointed their telescopes at this object. Okay, it's relatively close. If there was a signal coming from this, we have a relatively you know high belief that if there were, there were people trying to communicate with us, we'd be able to hear it with our big radio telescopes. We've not heard anything. Okay, there are no signals coming from this. Now, I expect, by the way, with this announcement, what has happened is there's maybe been a redoubling of efforts. Just let's double check and make sure really we're not hearing anything. Let's listen extra, extra close. But as of right now, there's been no signal whatsoever that we've received from any of these guys. So I think we can at least for the time being rule out that there is, you know, transmitting intelligent communicating life on any of these worlds right now. Now, the thing that's interesting you might ask is, oh, you know, and this is just one of those things that I find really, really fascinating to sort of think about. But um, you might ask, okay, you know, what if there were, there were, you know, organisms there, intelligent organisms that had the ability to listen, okay? Um, would they receive signals from us? And the answer for that actually is absolutely yes, okay? Um, when we send out radio broadcasts and what you might call open air TV broadcasts, those gets transmitted out in all directions, okay, um, out into space. And they travel at the speed of light. So this object is 39 and a half light years from Earth or from our sun. And so that means the light leaving the Earth takes 39 and a half years to get to that system, okay? And radio waves and television waves, which really got, you know, a subclass of radio waves, take the time to get that, take that amount of time to get there traveling at the speed of light. So one of the things that's kind of interesting is sort of to think about, you know, 39 and a half years ago, what left the earth? What was broadcast out into space? And so I did a little quick research in, on that, and I thought you guys might find that kind of interesting, maybe a little frightening to think about. So um, in August of 1977, which is when uh, the signals they are receiving now would have been sent, um, not 
too much longer from today, when I'm recording this at the, the beginning of March, on the first day of March here, um, they would be getting news of the death of Elvis Presley and his funeral, which uh, at the time was a very, very big deal. Um, and about two weeks after that, they would be getting news of the launch of Voyager 2, which of course is the object in the, 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 the object that human beings have made this farthest away from our planet at this time. Um, a year earlier than that, they would have uh, seen the uh, the summer games of the Montreal Olymp Olympics and uh, the landing of uh, Vikings 1 and 2 and, the, of course, the, the celebration of the bicentennial of the United States, among other things. So it's kind of interesting to think that that's the information they're receiving from us here in the next couple of weeks if there's somebody there to listen, which one kind of has to wonder. Um, so... Why is this kind of interesting, and where are we going to go from here? Well, the first thing that's really interesting about this from a scientific perspective, rather than sort of a, are there aliens perspective, which I think is a little less scientific sometimes. But um, the first thing that's really interesting here is we have all kinds of models that talk about planetary formation and how planets work and interact with their stars and all of that sort of thing. This system gives us a wonderful test ground for us to determine how good those models work. How well do they predict behavior? How do we have to tweak them? How do we have to rewrite those models in order to account for what we're seeing here? The models oftentimes are developed with um, sketchy data, or I mean, not sketchy data is not the best word, but just data that isn't well constrained. This system and our ability to observe it in great detail gives us a chance to really, really constrain some of these models and I think probably scientifically that's the best the best thing that may come out of this and what that's going to require is more data so first off of course what we're going to do is we're going to get more ground-based infrared telescopes looking at this thing Spitzer's going to look at it some more so I've, I think when I listened to the uh, to the press conference from NASA that talked about this I think you know in their next big observing cycle for Spitzer um, they've got another big chunk of time that Spitzer's going to use to observe this system, and again, that's going to further constrain the models. Um, we'll continue to do Hubble spectroscopy, and hopefully, you know, with Hubble spectroscopy, maybe we can look for some other things by taking some longer exposures and those sorts of things. Maybe we can get some more information. But sort of the big thing that's coming up is something known as the James Webb Space Telescope, and I want to talk about that just for a minute in conclusion. So what is the, the James Webb Space Telescope? Um, first off, if you're interested in some history about this thing, the, the folks over at Stuff You Missed in History class did a nice little episode on James Webb and how important he was as an administrator for the very young NASA um, and some of the things that had to happen there, how he, uh, he dealt with some issues of failure when the Apollo 1 accident took place and all of that. Um, NASA very much owes its existence to James Webb. So if you're interested in sort of the history of that, go over our, to uh, Stuff You Missed in History and check out their episode on that. But the Hubble Space Telescope, as wonderful uh, an instrument as it was, is limited, one, by the size of its uh, mirror, and two, it's limited by the technologies that we had when we planned and built that piece of technology. And it turns out that in the years since that was planned and then built, Telescope technology has just really massively advanced, okay? Things like segmented mirrors, shapeable mirrors, those kinds of things have really revolutionized ground-based um, telescopes and the observatories that sort of surround those instruments. And so it was sort of decided that, you know, once Hubble reached the end of its serviceable lifetime, which, by the way, it's done that like multiple times now. The Hubble is just this amazingly durable instrument that has just far, far, far exceeded its performance expectations. But, you know, all the good things have to come to an end and all pieces of technology eventually wear out. And so NASA began to plan for the Hubble Space Telescope replacement, and that's the James Webb Space Telescope. And it's going to be a bigger mirror. It's going to have the ability to do measurements across wider wavelengths of light. It's going to have a better ability to sort of deal with the light that we get from the sun in terms of making observations and all of that sort of thing. And so the James Webb Space Telescope offers us a quantum leap forward in what you would think of as optical, infrared, and a little bit of ultraviolet observation ability um, over what we have in orbit now. Um, it gets, a, again, all of these space telescopes get us above the Earth's atmosphere, give us a chance to absorb in wavelength, or observe, excuse me, in wavelengths that we can't because of absorption of the Earth's atmosphere. And just as importantly, give us the chance to make observations 
that are not distorted by the effect of the Earth's atmosphere, the refraction of the Earth's atmosphere, that thing that Tycho Brahe had such a hard time dealing with and trying to measure the parallax of Mars when he was trying to make those measurements. It gets you above all of that. And so the James Webb Space Telescope, if all goes well, will launch in 2018 and will become functional fairly soon after that. We'll begin to, to start taking a, a look at things. Um, and my guess is that this system is going to be pretty high on the priority list, that we're going to use the James Webb Space Telescope, I think most importantly, to try to do absorption spectroscopy on any atmospheres that these worlds have to see if we can determine if we see gases like carbon dioxide, methane, oxygen, those kinds of things. Gases that would be, you know, very likely the byproduct of processes that we understand here on Earth. Now, it could be that, you know, what's going, these planets could be just entirely lifeless. There could be, you know, they could be a lot like what we would think of as, as Mars or Venus or something like that, where they're, they're pretty much lifeless. But if we are able to observe those kinds of gases, in any real con you know in any real sort of concentration then we begin to think that okay maybe these worlds might be a lot more like what we see on the earth it could be that they're a lot like titan the the largest moon of saturn they might have some characteristics that look like maybe europa or something like that however you know what we're going to be looking for is those those marker elements in those atmospheres that uh, will give us a sense that maybe there are you know processes lifelike processes taking place on these worlds. Now to probably answer the final question, can we get to these worlds? With our present technology, no. I think, you know, I heard somebody, I heard a figure where if you, you know, you flew at the speed of the fastest jetliner, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 miles an hour or something like that, it would take you 44 million years to get to one, to get to this, this system, the solar system out there. Um, even if you're flying, you know, moving at uh, Voyager 2 speeds, the fastest thing, um, that we're, we've ever launched from the Earth, you're still talking, you know, on the order of hundreds of thousands, if not a million years. So using the technology that we have at the moment, no, we're probably, we can't get out there. However, you know, one of the things that I think you always have to kind of keep in mind, a hundred years ago, we were barely flying, okay? The Wright brothers had just barely gotten that craft off the ground and into the air. And in the hundred years since, you know, we now have permanently you know, crewed um, space stations orbiting in low Earth orbit. We've visited the closest celestial object to our world. We have plans to go to the next one. And so, you know, I don't ever want to say we won't ever visit this place, but it's going to be something that's going to take a lot of ingenuity and a lot of thinking and a lot of really amazing engineering. I think the better goal, and for those of you who are young listeners now and you're sort of thinking, what is what does this mean for me? I mean, this is really a wonderful field in which to do sciences. The scientists in the press conference from NASA said over and over and over again, this is a field that is exploding, this idea of doing exoplanet work and, you know, planetary science on this scale with real data where just a generation ago, literally 20 years ago, was the first, you know, the first um, report of a detection of one of these exoplanets using that uh, that radial velocity spectroscopy shift method that we talked about early in the episode. In 20 years from now, who knows what we're going to be able to do, what kinds of instruments we'll have up, who knows what we'll be able to see. And so for those of you interested in astronomy, in geology, in exobiology, those kinds of things, this is really an amazing field that you might want to kind of do some research on and kind of get into a little bit. I think this is just some really fascinating things. And given the fact that, like I said earlier in the show, 75% of all of the stars in our galaxy and 75% of all the stars in the universe are of this M-class type, this gives us a lot of hope and a lot of you know suspicion that there are an awful lot of these kinds of systems out there waiting to be observed with more powerful instruments and more clever technologies. And so I think this is just really an amazing amazing area of scientific advance just ready to be sort of investigated so anyway that kind of brings us to the end of our episode here i hope you've enjoyed it um we'll be back on the weekend um with our i think what will maybe our final episode on isaac newton um so until then full sails on your journey